Hello and welcome to Opportunity China's first in our series of four pre-departure webinars, starting your life in China. First of all, I'd just like to thank you all for joining me this evening. Um, there were many of those who I had emailed who said they were unable to watch tonight, but are going to watch in the future. And that goes for those of you who are watching today as well. All of our webinars will be available and will be put up on the Opportunity China YouTube channel and a link will be sent out afterwards. As well as that, all of the slides that you're going to see today will be sent out to you too, as well as additional materials, reading lists and optional exercises for you to do once you have completed the video itself. Uh, now, it'd probably be best if I just introduce myself. My name is Will Perrins. I am the Partnerships and Recruitment Manager for Opportunity China. I'm also a former teacher in China and one of the first ever participants on the Teach China Graduate Program. I lived and worked as a teacher in Shenyang in the northeast of China for several years before going into education management in my role, before finally coming round um, and working for Opportunity China to help those who are looking to come to China have as positive an experience in the country as I did. What we're going to do today is speak about starting your life in China. We're going to take a look at the ins and outs of the visa processes, of getting flights, of what to expect when you first arrive in China. But before we get into all of the nitty gritty, I think it's important to take a look, first of all, at what the journey ahead is going to look like for you. The road ahead in China is going to be long. It's going to occasionally be frustrating. You're going to see a lot of interesting sights along the way. You're going to see a lot of things that really excite you. You're going to see a lot of things that are going to be very different to anything you've seen before. It's also, for many of you, a really big unknown. For me, when I first left to go to China, I had absolutely no idea what to expect. I was walking into a country that had a very different language, a very different culture, a very different history, a country where the only news that I had ever had came from my own country and my own culture. I was really walking into a total unknown at that time. Arriving in China was one of the most interesting experiences I had ever had. And I'll go into a little more detail about the sights and sounds and smells that you can expect to experience upon arrival in China a little bit later. But what I think is important is thinking about the journey and road that each of you are going to take and what you're going to bring back from your experience in China. First of all, there are the places that you'll go. Many of you will have heard of the Great Wall of China. Many of you will have heard of the Bund and the Shanghai skyline. Many of you will may have even heard of uh, Yangshou or Guilin or even Jiang Jiajie with the floating mountains made famous from the film Avatar. But China is a country that's home to 1.4 billion people. That is one fifth of the world's population. It's a country that ranges from Arctic tundras in the north, east, all the way across to the great Gobi Desert in the west of the country. It has the tropical climates in the south in Hainan. It has the great metropolises that scatter throughout the entire country, the terracotta warriors in Xi'an, as well as the great grassy plains in Inner Mongolia. It's a country where no matter your tastes, no matter your preferences, you'll find something for you. And throughout this presentation today and this initial webinar today, we're going to take a look at images that have been submitted by teachers in China who came through us, by Teach China Graduate Program participants. Every image that you're going to see of China and of the sites is going to have come from one of our teachers. And we'll give you an idea of the places that you'll go and have the opportunity to visit whilst in China. Then, of course, there's the food you'll eat. One thing that's an eternal frustration to me, following up with many of our teachers who live, work and teach in China around two or three months after they've gone, is I write an email to them saying, uh, uh, what's your favorite thing in China so far? Can you tell me what, what thing you like the most in order to get a testimonial? And around 
three quarters of those who respond to me will just say the food, oh, the food, the food, the food. I'll stay here for four or five years just because of the food. And it's true, there are an enormous amount of delicious food types and different cuisines from all across the country. Whether you're looking for um, the seafood in the eastern Shandong province, if you're a fan of shrimp or lobster or crayfish, or if you're looking for the spicy food in Sichuan in the west, um, or Chongqing hot pot located close by, for those of you who can bear with something like that. Whether you're looking for the salty food in the north or the sweet food around Shanghai and the delicious dumplings that come with that eastern Jiangsu cuisine, well, there really is something for absolutely everyone. You'll never look at Chinese food in your own country the same way again. And eating in China, getting to know the culture, getting to know the aspects and the importance of cuisine and food will be something that'll be very acutely present in your life day to day, whether you're going out with your workmates, be they Chinese or be they American or British or other foreigners, you will experience Chinese dining culture and the cultural aspects that come with that. Many of you will also experience Chinese drinking culture and what comes with that as well, especially those of you in the north. Then, of course, there are the friends that you'll make. This, for me, is the most important thing that you'll take from China, the people that you'll meet and the friends that you'll make. As I alluded to earlier, there'll be all kinds of different people that you'll meet when you go to China. For instance, even in my city, a comparatively smaller second tier city of a mere 8 million people, there was a tight knit expat community that stuck together, that got to know one another, that treated each other well and looked after one another upon arrival. Everyone's new in China at some point and everyone is someone's China baby and eventually will become someone's China mummy or someone's China daddy. You'll be looked after by these expats. They'll help you acclimatize to what can be occasionally a strange and unnerving culture at times, a pace of life that's so fast. But I think more importantly, the friends that you'll make that will be Chinese, your work colleagues, people that you'll meet in public, people you'll dine with, the families of some of the students that you might teach, you'll have the opportunity to learn about their family, learn about their history, learn about China from these people, from people who know it, from people whose country it is, as opposed to from the news, as opposed to making decisions that are forced upon you. Making an opinion of a country really, really involves needing to know people from that country. The Chinese friends that I made showed me some of the most interesting, diverse and dense cultural elements to a civilization that's over 5,000 years old. Getting to know friends from China helped me broaden my horizons and it certainly helped me learn a language that in my entire life I never thought I'd be able to learn. And of course there's the work that you'll do. Among all of the traveling and socializing and getting to know the culture, it may fall away that you're there to work, you're there to teach. And teaching is the single most rewarding vocation you can do. As a teacher, you're imprinting and setting the knowledge and sometimes values of students that they'll hold for the rest of their life. You're teaching them a skill, not just a subject, but a skill that they are going to almost certainly utilize in their life. As the world gets smaller, as countries get closer, as interconnectivity becomes more and more important, learning and using a different language, a language that's been taught to you by a native speaker, a language that's been taught to you by someone from a country where it is used as a first language is more important than ever. ever. And that is certainly the case in China. In tomorrow's webinar, we're actually going to be looking at education in China and why English is such an important subject and why being taught English by someone from a native speaking country or someone from, who, from a country that has studied in a native speaking country is valued so highly in China. But let's take a look at the content for today's webinar. We're first of all going to look at pre-departure. This is going to involve all sorts of information on 
what you're going to need to take with you, what you're going to need to prepare for your visas, um, how you go through the process of authenticating documents and ensuring that all of this is done correctly. Insurance, flights, how long you should take, what sort of timelines you should expect to have. We're going to look at arrival in China. We're going to look at what to expect when you first arrive. We're going to look at the sights and sounds and smells that you're going to experience in your first few days in China. We're also going to look at practically what's going to happen when you arrive there. For all a lot of you know at the moment, you're just going to be getting on a plane and going into the complete unknown. Well, it's important to have a bit of understanding of what is likely to happen after your initial arrival. We're then going to look at what it means to be a foreigner in China. Being a foreigner in China is a really interesting concept and it's very different to being a foreigner in almost any other country in the world. And we're going to look a little bit more deeply into that, maybe tackle a couple of thorny issues with it as well. We're also going to look at some core cultural concepts that exist in China and why it's important you understand these cultural concepts and some of the areas you may want to shy away from with it. We're then going to look at culture shock and homesickness. These are incredibly important cultural elements before finally looking at a Q&A at the end of our webinar. It's important to mention at this stage as well um, that after each section, I am going to stop and offer you the opportunity to write any questions that you might have into our chat. Um, if you do have any questions, please do pop them in there even if they're ones that you are coming up with now that I can answer a little bit later. I do have a window open with our chat on, so please do feel free to ask any questions at any time to me. Right, well, let's crack on with pre-departure. Pre-departure. So, getting prepared to go to China is for many people the most unnerving part of their entire experience. You'll have a huge amount of excitement in the weeks and months leading up to it. It'll be followed by nerves of jumping into an unknown. It'll be followed up by frustrations of wanting to get everything sorted with your visa and your invitation letter. And it can seem like a little bit too much. But having done this many, many times, it's easy for me to say it's quite simple. Um, but a little bit of patience, a little bit of understanding, a little bit of knowledge that in China, things can take a very long time and then suddenly appear is very important to take into this process going forward. It's important to go into it with that understanding. Things in China most certainly do not operate the same way they do over here. Um, sometimes you will hear things at quite short notice, um, but navigating your way around, not panicking and coming to a mutually beneficial understanding of what is the best path of action to take throughout your visa process is important. Opportunity China have had years of experience doing the dealing with the visa process, working with all of our partners in China. We are a constant point of contact for you if there are ever any issues, um, and we will always be able to ensure that anything that comes up can be resolved in a timely manner. Well, let's take a look at TEFL qualifications. First of all, a TEFL qualification is a teach English as a foreign language qualification. This is likely going to be very new to a large number of you. The reason I bring this up first is because this is almost certainly going to be the first thing that most of you are going to have to complete. When it comes to the requirements of teaching in China, I'm going to go through in a little more detail all of them in a moment, but a TEFL qualification is likely going to be the one thing that most of you will not have or will not be expecting to have by June or July. You'll be required to have a degree certificate, a clean criminal record, and a TEFL qualification. The requirements for the vast majority of schools in China are 120 hours with a TEFL qualification. The vast majority of schools in China, including almost those, almost all of them that we work with, allow you to do an online TEFL qualification. Some of the schools that we work with have their own that they provide and we'll send a link to you. If they do that, make sure you do it from them. It'll usually be subsidized. 
If your graduate program partner school does not, we recommend using TEFL Express. There's a link here um, and a link on our website to TEFL Express where you'll be able to receive a discounted course. We usually recommend allowing yourself at least three weeks to complete your TEFL qualification before submitting it for your visa. So bringing this up first as something that you should take into consideration before anything else is very important. Let's take a look now at the visa process in a nutshell. Well, the visa process for China is something that many of you may have started. Many of you may have um, started getting your TEFL qualifications, getting your documents in order. Um, but essentially, as a quick rundown, you'll need to collate all of your required documents. That is, for the vast majority of you, going to be your bachelor's degree certificate once it's been received a basic DBS or criminal record check from your home country. So that can be a police check if you're in the United States, a Garda check if you're in the Republic of Ireland, um, a Royal Mounted Police check if you are in Canada. You'll need to have your, or your documents all authenticated. Now it's important that you always relay back to the information that is given to you by your school HR coordinator. Some of you will need to have your degree certificate, your DBS check or criminal record check, and your TEFL certificate all authenticated separately. Some of you may need to just have your degree and your criminal record check done. Some of you may need to have your degree and criminal record check fully authenticated and your TEFL certificate merely notarized. It's important that you relay back to the information that's been given by your HR coordinator. If anything is unclear, please do come to us with any questions about this. You'll then need to send the required documents to your school once they have been authenticated. These will need to be scanned and sent across to the school first of all in order for them to check that they are going to be accepted. Once that's been done, the school will give you an address and a delivery service, a recommended delivery service to mail these to China. These will then be, a, these will then be used as part of your work permit letter application in China. Your work permit letter application will generally take around four or five weeks. Sometimes these can be turned around a lot quicker. Um, your necessary paperwork will be emailed to you. It used to be that they were mailed to you. They can now be emailed to you, which cuts out quite a lot of time. Um, it'll come in the form of a work permit letter of invitation. It'll have a barcode on it. You will want to print that out and you'll want to apply online for your working Z visa, your visa application service center or embassy or consulate. It'll usually take around four three to three or four days, working days for this to be processed, depending on the service that you want to use. Once it's been processed, you'll be able to pick it up or have it delivered back to you, and it'll come in the form of a physical sticker in your passport. So let's look a little more deeply at what those required documents for your Z visa are going to be. First of all, there's your degree certificate. So many of you will be graduating in July. Some of you will be graduating in June. Um, some of you may even be graduating a little bit later if you're looking at going to China um, September, October, November, or even December time. Your degree certificate is going to be the first thing that will be needed. Now, some of you may be graduating a little bit later, but receiving your degree certificate early. If you're graduating a little bit later, it's always worth checking with your universe, with the relevant department at your university if an early copy of your degree certificate can be mailed to you before your graduation ceremony. Many of you at different universities will be receiving your degree certificates before your graduation ceremony anyway, but for the sake of getting this done quickly, it's usually better to inquire as to whether this will be a possibility. The worst they can say is no, and that's fine. You'll also need a no criminal record check. 
Now, for the vast majority of you, this is going to be a basic disclosure, or for those of you in Scotland, a Disclosure Scotland certificate. You can see that on the bottom right of our screen there. It's a Disclosure Scotland certificate. For those of you in England and Wales, it'll be a basic DBS. On our website and using the link that you see there, if you go to the visa section, you will be able to find a full guide on how to go about attaining this basic disclosure um, or DBS basic. You will also need, well, the majority of you will also need to complete a TEFL certificate and receive the hard copy of that TEFL certificate as well. So this is another important thing to note. Those of you who are going to be completing a TEFL certificate, make sure you ensure that you have the certificate mailed to you, not just a PDF copy. It used to be the case that a PDF copy would be okay in China. It's certainly not the case anymore for any of our schools. So you will need to have the original certificate mailed to you. You'll also need a photocopy of passport information page, a copy of your CV that can be sent to your school, six passport style photos, and for many of you, a completed or at least partially completed medical check. This will be sent over to you by the HR coordinator from your school, but if you want to take a look at it early, we do have a copy as well, and you can find it again in the visa section of our website. Um, with the medical check, you can, in most cases, have most of the medical check filled out by your local GP, and you can exclude some of the items that will cost you money. So these would be a blood test, an ECG, an X-ray. Um, you can exclude these for most cases with it, and you will almost certainly need to take another medical once you arrive in China as well. But completing as much of this medical check as possible will be beneficial for your application and how speedily they can get this through. Now, as I alluded to earlier, several documents are going to need to be what's called authenticated. This is a process of having them legalized and recognized by the Chinese government. Documents, in order to be fully authenticated, need to go through three steps. They, first of all, need to be notarized by a public notary. It used to be the case that any solicitor or lawyer would be able to do this for you. Now it's become trickier and we recommend only using a public notary service. Documents can then be legalized and apostled by the relevant department of state or government. So for those of you in the United Kingdom, this will be the Foreign Commonwealth Office. Again, in our Living in China Authenticating Documents section under the Visa section of our website, you will be able to get a step-by-step -step guide of what to do for each of these and links to the relevant State Department, which will include instructions on how to get your document legalized and apostled by the relevant authority. Once your document has been apostled, you'll receive a stamp on the back of your document, which will look like this. And you'll then need to take those documents that have been notarized and apostled to your nearest Chinese embassy and apply there to receive a stamp of authentication. This will usually take around four or five days to be completed and does need to be done in person. When you're finished, you will have documents that will include a letter of notarization from a public notary stating that your document is real and genuine. You will have this stamp, this apostle from your government, and you will have this stamp from the Chinese embassy. Then, and only then, can your documents be recognized as being genuine and legal by the Chinese immigration authorities. It is a bit of a pain, and I know that that sounds like a lot, but it is very important that you go through this process one step at a time, use our guide, or even easier, you can use a service to do this on your behalf. 
Services are available to complete these steps on your behalf, depending on the documents that are required. These can be very competitively priced. You can authenticate your documents when you're out of the country. In Britain, Opportunity China do have a partnership, have a partnership with a trusted authentication service provider. If you uh, want this to be done for you, simply email us and we'll send you a link to them and put you in touch with the authentication provider. Remember to check, double check and triple check what your precise requirements are, whether you need to have your degree, TEFL and your criminal record check all fully authenticated, all three of those steps, whether you need to just have your degree and your criminal record check fully authenticated, or whether you need to have your degree and criminal record check fully authenticated and your TEFL certificate simply notarized. These services will understand exactly what you mean if you send it across to them. They'll be able to do it all on your behalf. They'll take it to the Foreign Commonwealth Office. They'll take it to the Chinese Embassy. We heavily, heavily recommend using one of these services. It likely turns out cheaper in the end as well because it saves on things like train fares for those of you who don't live in London. Um, and it saves a lot of stress and faff too. So once you have sent your collated authenticated documents, as well as those other documents like your CV, medical check to your employer, they will apply for a work permit letter that will be emailed to you around four or five weeks once your application has been fully submitted. This is called a notification letter of foreigners work permit in the People's Republic of China. This is different to a physical work permit once you are in the country. I'll get onto that a little bit later. Um, it will have a barcode at the top that you can see here, and you'll need to print out this letter. Um, once you have printed this out, you will need to complete the visa application form, which is now online for the vast majority of you. For some of you, there is still a paper copy that you can print out complete, but for those of you in the United Kingdom or in Ireland, then you are going to have to complete the online form. You can find it at visaforchina.org and then select the country of your choice. The reason why I put this in there, um, because it would seem potentially obvious that if you search visa for China or visa application for China, that the first things that would come up in Google are the right things. They are not. Um, the search engine optimization for Chinese visa centers is terrible. Um, and sometimes it can be a little bit of a challenge just finding the right place in itself. This is the right place, visaforchina.org, and then selecting your relevant country and nearest Visa for China center before following the instructions of how to make your application online. Um, once you have completed your application, you'll need to print out the forms that you have completed and take with you your passport, several passport style, uh, four passport style photos, and all other necessary documents that will be stated to you on the Visa for China application program page. This will include that earlier mentioned work permit letter here. You'll need to book an appointment online. You'll be able to do this again on that Visa for China center page. Um, these appointments can get quite busy around the summertime. Uh, so we do recommend getting your application sent off as soon as you receive this work permit notarization letter, um, or as soon as your contact in China tells you, you know, it's probably a good idea to get your application sent off now. Service will usually take between three and four days. Um, there is an express service that takes three days and standard service that takes four. You will also be required to provide your fingerprints when you go in as well. This is a relatively new requirement. Final steps. So you've got your visa in your passport. You've completed all of the authentication processes. You've had your medical check. Well, there are a few other things that you are going to need to do before you go to China. There's getting your flight booked. Once your visa's in your passport, you're gonna to want to get that. So you're gonna know when you're gonna be heading out. Opportunity China work with uh, STA Travel to provide flexible 
book flexible flight tickets for those looking to, to China. You can visit the section on our website on that, or you can email us for more information about getting flexible flight tickets, but we do recommend getting them. You will need to send your flight details to your employer, so they'll be able to pick you up once you arrive in China. Opportunity China will also send you a packing list with all the essentials that you're going to need to take with you. Print this out, tick everything off before you go. You might need to do a little bit of shopping to make sure you have everything. You'll need to also get a VPN. I'll go into a little more detail about what a VPN is and why it's important in our third webinar. Um, but in China, many websites are blocked, including Facebook, all Google services, including Gmail and YouTube, as well as Twitter and Instagram. If you're going to want to access these, you're going to want to use a VPN. Opportunity China work with VPN Express, um, and we will send out a link to them later on in later on um, to each of you. Most schools will cover basic or local health or accident insurance, but many of these insurance policies will be local to the city or province where you are going to be resident. We do recommend taking out an additional travel insurance policy. Opportunity China work with Ensley Insurance to provide a comprehensive um, insurance policy as well for those of you who are wanting to take that out, who are wanting to go traveling across China and also across Asia and other countries as well, you'll have the chance to be covered by that. We do recommend this. Of course, there is also inoculations and getting jabs done. Opportunity China cannot offer explicit medical advice on this, but what we can say is we recommend visiting your GP and your travel nurse to see what you are going to need when you travel to China. Um, some of you uh, may need in inoculations such as hepatitis A, hepatitis B, rabies. Um, some of you, depending on where you are in China, might need tick bite encephalitis, but it is vital that you visit your travel nurse and receive advice from them on exactly what you need. They'll have a map of all of the different areas in China that you can point to, and then they'll be able to tell you exactly what jabs you need. But it is important to get these done before you head out to China. Uh, so I'd just like to open it to any questions that anyone might have on the pre-departure process. Okay, in which case we will move on just for now. Remember, if you do have any questions, please do just pop them in our chat box. So, arrival in China, the next step. Upon arrival in China, you will be picked up by your employer. They'll send a representative to come and meet you. You'll have a little name card that they'll hold up. Some of you will be arriving at the same um, time as many others. Um, so some of you will have, uh, will be getting off the plane in groups. Um, you will have an orientation session as well um, upon arrival where you'll have the opportunity to get to know your city, get to know the area around, your employers will take you um, to a local restaurant uh, and welcome you. Um, sometimes this can all be a little bit blurry and it can be a little bit hectic after getting off a plane and arriving. Um, but orientation is one of the funnest and most exciting bits of arriving in China. Um, you will get to meet a lot of people who you know. Um, your colleagues will often be incredibly excited to meet you because it will take them back to when they first arrived in China. Um, you'll also have a lot of practical things um, done upon your arrival as well, one of which will be registering with the police. You'll be taken by your employer to register at your nearest local police station within 48 hours of arriving in China. This registration is quite simple and painless, um, not intimidating as it might sound, thinking of going and registering in a foreign country's um, police station. You'll also, in your first week, have your bank account 
set up. This will usually be with one of the big banks in China, such as China Merchants Bank, um, China Agricultural, um, Agricultural Bank of China, um, or Bank of China. Um, you will usually have a cash card that you'll be able to connect to various different apps, including um, Didi, which is the Chinese equivalent of Uber. It's incredibly useful, incredibly easy to use. I personally find it better than Uber. You can hail normal taxis with it as well, um, and you can connect that directly to your card. You can also connect WeChat and Alipay directly to your Chinese card once you have it. One thing that you'll very quickly see in China is that cash within cities is pretty much no longer used. Everyone scans barcodes and pays for things using WeChat Pay or Alipay. So getting your bank account set up nice and early and getting used to using these systems is going to be really important. You'll also have a Chinese phone and SIM help set up with you. Um, with Chinese SIM cards and numbers, you'll need to register your passport number with a Chinese telecoms provider. Your employers will help you do this. Um, and this will all be set up and set you up that unique identity. You'll be able to use that phone identity to be able to make payments through WeChat and Alipay as well. You'll also have your medical in China. Your medical in China um, is very much um, a rotary belt system. You'll have several different things done. You'll enter, you'll have an x-ray, you'll go to another room, you'll have a blood test, you'll go to another room, you'll have an eye test, you'll go to another room, um, you will have a blood pressure test, um, and so on and so on and so on. Uh, within your first week, this is often the most stressful thing that you'll experience upon arrival in China, but being prepared for it um, and feeling ready for it is very important. Sometimes in China, there's a bit of a here and now culture, and you may not be told about it until the day before. So making you aware of what to expect before you do this is very important. Um, for, uh, for women, it's important um, to remember not to wear any skirts or any um, long dresses during this because uh, you will be required to lift them for things like x-rays and it can be quite uncomfortable. So it's just important to remember to wear comfortable clothing during this initial process. Um, it is quite straightforward, just as long as you're ready for it. But if you don't feel prepared for it, it can sometimes feel a little bit invasive. But what can you expect upon arriving in the country? What can you expect to see? What can you expect to hear? What can you expect to feel? Well, first of all, the size and scale of China will become very apparent to you. It will be a big slap in the face. China has over 150, over 250 cities with populations in excess of a million people. The average size city that you will be going to as members of the Teach China graduate program will be around eight or nine million. For some of you going to cities like Beijing and Shanghai, you'll be going way north of the 20 million metropolitan population mark. The neon lights and modernity of cities in China is something that strikes a lot of us, especially those of you who are going to be coming from countries like Great Britain or Ireland, where we're used to these windy roads that go around, these thin streets, these quiet low houses, this amount of space that we can experience. In China, they build up and they build wide. Get ready to see big, wide roads. Get ready to see neon lights on all of the buildings that will be around you. Get ready to see a huge amount of, uh, a huge amount of advertisement, a huge amount of giant visual screens. Um, get ready to see modernity in its purest form. It is exciting for those of you who come from sleepy places. It is a very interesting thing to see for those of you who are going to a country with metropolises like this for the first time. Some of you who are going to cities like Chengdu, some of you who are going to cities like Zhengzhou, some of you who are going to cities um, such as even Nanjing or Wuxi might not expect to see giant skyscrapers and neon lights on the scales that you might expect in Beijing and Shanghai, but you will. Outside of capital cities in your home country, any second tier city in China will likely be the largest city most of you 
will have lived in. Then there is the street food. There is street food littered all over China. As I have alluded to earlier, food is an incredibly important part of Chinese culture. And street food is no exception to that. There'll be vendors selling all sorts of delicious things from Tua, um, which is essentially a sort of um, shish kebab style meat uh, and vegetable um, on a stick that you'll see. You can see in the picture on the top left there, there'll be tofu um, rings on a stick as well. You'll also be able to sample some more um, some stranger and more exotic delicacies such as frog um, in parts of Beijing and Shenzhen. You'll even be able to try things such as scorpion and snake, which I had the uh, honor of being able to sample earlier this year. There's also going to be an enormous pungent smell that you'll experience when you first see street food, and that will be the smell of stinky tofu. Stinky tofu tastes an awful lot better than it smells. Please don't worry about that. Um, but as well as the smell, you'll also experience the noise. You'll experience car horns. You'll experience driving, traffic. China is an audible place. It is a place where being noisy, where being loud, where expressing emotion and joy and glee um, is encouraged in public and busy places. Those of you who come from countries like the United Kingdom, where we value things such as um, excessive decorum or ambiance, um, might be a little shocked and a little jolted to hear the noise and vibrancy of a second or first tier city in China. Then there is the energy and pace. The energy and pace of China is enormous. You will experience a very fast paced style of life. You will experience people walking and jostling and popping in front of each other, getting ready to meet and match that pace is going to be very important. It's certainly something that I struggled with as a meek, polite little Englishman in my first few months uh, living and working in China, especially on the subway. I was very, very nervous to get on the subway, to jostle my way in, to um, sort of squeeze in past a bunch of other people, especially elderly people. But very quickly in China, you are going to realize that it's absolutely fine to have a little bit of shoving and a little bit of a push to get your way in. Then, of course, there is being a foreigner in China. Well, being a foreigner in China is something that many people are nervous about. And there is definitely an excuse to be nervous about it. China is a country of 1.4 billion citizens. 1.4 billion citizens, one fifth of the world's population. 91.51% of that population are Han Chinese. And the vast majority of the rest of the population are other Chinese ethnicities. 8.49% of the population on top of that. Which doesn't leave a huge amount for the rest of the population you are in a very small fraction of a percent in this country not being Chinese. Now, this is unnerving for quite a lot of people, but it's important you understand it. Even in large cities that can be more international, like Beijing or Shanghai or Shenzhen, although that foreigner population does certainly go up a huge amount, it's not like in London where you can sit on a tube carriage and there will be people from every corner of the world on it with you. No matter where you are in China, if you get on a tube carriage, you are more likely than not going to be the only foreigner in that carriage. And because of that, there's a huge amount of curiosity, especially from the middle age or older generation in China. 
in tomorrow's webinar, I'll go in on in Wednesday's webinar, I'll go a little more into detail of China's history and the reasons as to why this is. But China for decades has been very closed off. China has been a country that literally slammed its doors shut to the rest of the world for decades. And until China's opening up and reform, foreigners simply didn't exist at all in China. And many elderly people, if they're coming to the city on holiday, may not have ever seen a foreigner in their life outside of television or in newspapers or in pictures. And this curiosity often finds its way um, of, of, of exercising itself in things such as stairs and photographs. It's important that I say, first of all, before anything else, that this is all done in an entirely harmless and benevolent way. I have never experienced attention in China from simply being a foreigner that has been overtly negative. I've certainly felt a lot of stares. I've certainly heard a lot of people saying, oh, there's a foreigner there. But very quickly, you'll realize it's not like in this country where being mindful of someone's otherness is seen as very wrong. In China, it's simply done out of a case of curiosity. And it's quite nice in many ways. A lot of people can feel a bit like a celebrity. Um, those of you who are going to slightly smaller cities will certainly be having people coming up to you and having their photographs taken with you and paying you compliments about how lovely your eyes look or how big your nose is, which by the way is a very good thing in China. Um, but being a foreigner in China also creates a niche industry for yourself. And in some ways this is very good um, because there are a lot of expat restaurants and bars that form hubs for expat communities in China. These areas are generally located close to foreign embassies or consulates within second tier cities. And in first tier cities, there are entire areas that are pretty much dedicated to foreigners. So if you're in Beijing, you might go to San Lutun. If you're in Shenzhen, you might go to SeaWorld. Um, and these areas are really great places for you to meet people who have been through what you've been through to widen your circle of friends and also to meet Chinese friends who really want to practice their English and really want to meet foreigners. Um, one of the best ways to ensure that you are going to be on a level upon arrival in China is downloading the most popular app, which is WeChat and getting yourself familiar with that. Um, one of the most common things that you're going to be asked upon arrival in China by a lot of Chinese people is, which is, do you have WeChat? Weixin or WeChat is the most used and the most popular app in China. It is an instant messenger. Pretty much all your professional and personal communication will be done through WeChat. Your work will likely want to add you to work WeChat groups to organize things. So getting familiar with it and using it a little bit is gonna be very important before you start. Questions on arrival in China now. I'm quite conscious that um, uh, there is a delay on this, so I did miss Ashley's comment. Um, we do have um, an Opportunity China coordinator who is answering questions as well and very kindly answered Ashley's questions there. So I'm just going to leave it maybe about a minute for anyone to write any questions here. Ah, thank you, Ron. Uh, when preparing bank accounts in China, will I need to transfer money from UK accounts to use in deposits, for example, accommodation and initial living, or will I be able to use UK while settling in? That is a really, really good question, Rowan. Um, there are a few answers to it. Um, my first answer is going to be bring as much cash as you can to China. 
transferring money into China and transferring money out of China can be a massive pain. It's not as easy as doing it in Europe where you just need an IBAN or even in America. China is very, very protective of its currency and of its banking system. Um, so we will send you information on this a little bit later, but this is an important part to pick up on. So what I would recommend doing first of all, Rowan, is taking money in cash as much as you can with you um, and um, having that transferred into renminbi before you leave, um, bringing that with you, and then you can deposit all of that cash straight into your Chinese bank account, which can be used to pay for the deposit um, on your apartment if you are um, going down that route. Um, another route is you can use cash from your bank account in the West as well. Um, transferring money to your Chinese bank account will be tricky. The reason I suggest using, um, the reason I suggest taking cash with you in the first instance is that if you use a foreign bank account in China, you're not going to be able to pay the money directly from the bank to the landlord or the organization. You're going to, again, have to go and take cash out in China but there is going to be a fee. For some of you, it's gonna be a very small fee, um, depending on your bank, but some banks do charge a larger fee for withdrawing cash from a UK bank account in China. Um, so I do recommend withdrawing cash from your UK account before you go out and having it changed into renminbi as much as you can. Does anyone else have any questions just at the moment? Yes, that's right. It's it is important as well to ensure that you um, to ensure that you inform your bank before you travel. Uh, Thomas, uh, on the visa checklist, it says once you've received the DBS certificate, you should post it back to get it notarized, separate notarization to the notary public one. Ah, yes, that's a very good question. Um, so this gets a little more complicated. So um, if you want to use a service to do everything, um, so the service that will do your notarization, that will go to the FCO and legalize it and get the sample authentication from the Chinese embassy, don't worry about needing to do that. However, if you're wanting to do each step by yourself, you are going to be able to save a little bit of cash by contacting um, by contacting the disclosure and barring service, letting them know that you are going to send your DBS back to them and you want them to legalize it. Um, this is on the um, disclosure barring services website. Um, it's also there on public notary for Scotland. It's actually a little more useful because no, uh, because basic disclosures for uh, those living in Scotland, it gives you a direct address to send it back to. Um, you will be able to send it back to them and what they'll be able to do is they'll be able to notarize it in house. So if you're doing everything separately, you'll be able to save yourself the cost of getting a notary to notarize your criminal record check separately. Um, so you'll simply be able to get it done by the FCO and then they'll send it to uh, done by um, the disclosure barring service and they'll be able to and then you'll be able to send it straight to the FCO and to the Chinese embassy. Ashley, okay, great. Um, so does that mean if we did the process ourselves that each step of the authentication would have a charge? And if so, uh, what are the charges? Again, that's a really, really good question. Um, so it very, very much depends on where you are and how you're doing this and what service you are using. Um, so for instance, getting a document notarized can vary quite wildly. Um, depending on the service that you are going to be using. Um, so getting your document done by a, um, getting your document notarized by a notary public, generally you're looking at around sort of 50 pounds. There are some that may be able to do it for you 
for a little bit less than that. Um, but the common answer to that is going to be around 50 pounds for that. Um, if you are going to be getting it sent to the FCO, um, there will be a charge for that as well. Again, it depends on how many documents you're going to be sending out. Um, what we will do for you is we'll send a full list of costs um, that will be applicable for you. Um, but it's usually £45 to have it done by the FCO. Um, and then finally, to have the stamp done by the Chinese embassy. They're continually changing it. When I last looked, it was um, around £25 to have your document authenticated by the embassy. Um, so to have it notarized, to have your letter of attestation done, it's usually around £50 for each document. That's right. Um, but if you're doing it each step yourself, it is worth shopping around. Um, and it's worth getting it done by someone local as well. So you can just simply pop in, give them your documents and have it done there. Um, there are people who I know who have had it done significantly cheaper than that. It really does depend on where you are based um, for using a public notary. Uh, does anyone else have any other questions just at the moment? Okay, great. Let's move on. So, cross-cultural understanding. Cross-cultural understanding is vitally important when you're moving to a country with a culture as different as China's. There are going to be things that you're going to experience related to China's culture that are going to be frustrating, that you're going to greatly enjoy, that you're going to find fascinating, that you're going to find you disagree with, that you're going to find you agree with more than certain things you think are a better idea than in the West. There's going to be an enormous mishmash of emotions that you're going to feel as you initially try to traverse this culture. It's important to remember that China has over 5,000 years of continuous civilization. And within these 5,000 years, many cultural tenets have remained the same. It's important to note as well that within these 5,000 years, much of China's philosophy, much of China's sociology, has been very different to our own. Whereas in the West, we've had philosophers such as Kant, Descartes, John Stuart Mill, Hobbes, philosophers who have expressed ideas of religion as well as liberty, freedom, individualism. In China, it has been based more on ideas of thinkers such as Confucius, more on ideas of a cohesive whole, of the group, of the combined, being more important than the individual. And it's important to remember that when thinking about a lot of behavior that happens in China and a lot of how things work and operate in China and the reasons why some things are viewed as being very important that we might not view as being important in the West. One of the most important features in Chinese culture is mianzi or face. Mianzi is vital to understanding the nature of relationships in China. It's vital to understanding the relationships of nature and of relationships in work, as well as social relationships. The notion of face might seem simple at first. I'm sure the vast majority of you have heard of saving face and keeping face, um, an idea of maintaining pride, of maintaining, um, of maintaining an appearance of respectability, of being reliable. In China, it's much deeper than that. In China, having face means you are a valuable person, a valuable asset to society, to the whole, that you're a trustworthy person. Having face is incredibly important in China. Showing and displaying kindness, showing and displaying that you understand, sympathize, and have 
a respect for Chinese culture and Chinese people is incredibly important. Having face continually is a massive asset in China and for many people viewed as a must. Not having face, well, this is almost seen as, um, this is seen as a very bad thing in China. Those who have been disgraced um, are seen as not having face. Those who are rude, those who do not respect Chinese culture or Chinese history are not having face. Not having face generally means that people won't want to have much to do with you. And part of having face and maintaining face and keeping face comes from giving face, showing respect, being humble. Very often, if you're going to be at banquets, you'll find that people go all around a table and offer a toast to everyone at the table. They give face to every single person. And in order to have face, you must first give face, you must first give respect. People being very humble about their nature is an important aspect of giving face, is an important aspect of having face. Um, showing respect to everyone around the table, especially the elderly, is incredibly important if you're eating. Giving a toast, um, making a sacrifice. One thing that I did was sing for a whole group of people. I gave them all face by giving them a performance. Um, and through doing that, I was able to not lose face because it was something that was requested with me as a whole. Um, but losing face is equally important to understand. Now, losing face can seem obvious in one sense, say being dishonest or deceiving someone or being rude or bad, but it becomes a little more complex. Losing face um, can be something as simple as um, not saying hello to an elderly co-worker in the morning. They may see that as disrespect and may see that you've lost face and people around you and colleagues around you may see that you've lost face. Many of your Western colleagues will be very, very happy to sort of correct you and be very understanding of it. Um, but coming to realize this is incredibly important. Um, and causing others to lose face can be a very devastating thing. Um, so not wanting to engage in... Um, not, not accepting invites to something can be very troublesome and um, needing to navigate your way around that is very important. Um, when I speak a little more about Chinese culture in the third webinar, I'll talk about a few scenarios where you can traverse a difficult situation of rejecting an offer because you have other plans whilst not causing the inviter or host to lose face. And then, of course, there's not wanting face. Um, not wanting face is generally seen as a form of insolence or a sort of rebellion, very popular among teenagers in China. Um, but it's also popular among many expats in China who are very often forgiven for not wanting face because it's not their culture. But understanding and engaging with face, I think, is really one of the most important, one of the most rewarding things about being in China. Yeah, you're going to get it wrong a huge amount of times. I know I certainly did. I certainly lost a lot of face, caused a lot of people to lose face and was eventually forgiven for it, but was better and stronger for that. Was able to understand this quite complex and dense system um, a whole lot better. And speaking of complex and dense, that leads me on to my next key component of Chinese culture, which is guanxi. Guanxi is the concept of personal relations. Personal relations in China is something that is vital to both um, your societal well-being and um, your social well-being, but also any potential um, business or, or professional well-being that you're going to have in the future. Guanxi governs all aspects of Chinese life and interactions, both personal and professional. It's an intrinsically linked to Mienza in a way. Um, if Mienza is, uh, is, is the core component, core cultural component of how you should behave as an individual in China, Guangxi is the arena in which that operates um, and the web of interpersonal relationships in which that operates. Being seen favorably in the eyes of a person with a great network that they can introduce you to is very important. Um, I had the opportunity to meet 
people of certain um, statures and be involved in certain banquets that I never thought in my life I'd be able to um, through Guanxi and relations and connections. But I was also able to meet a huge amount of like-minded people who love just doing what I did of sort of chilling out outside and having barbecue and were interested in similar films that I did because of the Guanxi networks that I was able to achieve. Um, and importantly, many people that you meet will stay in contact with you. Those of you who are interested in potentially at the end of this setting up businesses with China, which is an amazing opportunity right now in the world, will find that many of the relationships you build will be able to connect you with other people who will almost certainly be able to help you out. Everyone in China knows someone who knows someone who knows someone who can help you out. And in China, it is very much who you know and who the person you know knows. You can see here um, a little bit of a visual representation as to how networks or professional networks and social networks in China work as a much more complex interweaven web um, than how they do in the West. And of course, when we're speaking about culture, culture shock is something that cannot be avoided. It's experienced by almost everyone who lives abroad for a significant period of time. And living abroad in a culture and a society is different as China's, you will almost certainly experience culture shock. Culture shock can broadly be split into four phases. These phases will be experienced for different lengths of time, for different people. Um, the first is the honeymoon stage, the second the frustration stage, the third adjustment, and fourth acceptance stage. And then of course you have reverse culture shock, which is another item that we'll touch on briefly. But let's take a look at our first stage, the honeymoon stage. So these are a few pictures from me during my honeymoon stage. Um, during my very exciting trip to go into the countryside of China and visit some rural farmlands. I got to ride on some horsebacks across the grassland of northern China, which was incredibly exciting and amazing. I visited Shanghai and went up the, um, went up the Pearl Oriental Tower and saw all across the Shanghai skyline and the Bund. I celebrated Chinese New Year um, and experienced all of the fireworks and the food and the drink that came with that all of the new friends that I had met that were fantastic. It felt like an amazing holiday. It felt like the first few days of what was going to be the most exciting and interesting year I'd ever had. There was this huge amount of energy and this huge explorative sense that I wouldn't have in the United Kingdom. Just to want to walk to different roads to see what things were like because this country was so exciting and so different and so new. And not to mention how everything was so cheap. How I could go to a shop and to a restaurant and eat out every single night and not worry about my wallet being any lighter. How I could go to a bar and get a pint for a pound. It was so exciting and so interesting. And then eventually I reached levels of frustration. And this started with a few niggling aspects. It started with um, starting to get a little more annoyed with people stopping me and taking pictures of people jostling and bustling into the train. I started to think to myself, well, this isn't like Britain. Why is it like this? This fast pace has become chaotic. These small and incessant things that I previously found funny or exciting or interesting started to bother me and irritate me and every grievance that I felt began to become exaggerated. The small friendship groups that I had made became uh, more and more claustrophobic and I became more and more irritated with the people that were around me because I felt there wasn't a broad enough spectrum of people that I could find. And then of course I started to become homesick. I started to miss my parents, I started to miss my friends, I started to miss everyone and everything around me. I started to feel as if, oh no, maybe China isn't for me, maybe living abroad isn't for me. And if you feel this, remember this passes. And this eventually leads into the adjustment stage. Well, I started to feel a little more comfortable in my work, which was a big turning point for me. I started to get a little more used to what to expect on the street. Frustrations became more subdued. There were certain things about the country that still irritated me because they were so different. Certain things I found hard and annoying and um, the fast paced nature, the short notice attitude. But I began to acclimatize and accept this pace of life. 
in China, you'll very quickly learn um, a saying, which is TIC, this is China. When something happens that's strange or uh, very different, something that wouldn't happen in the West, it's what a lot of people will say. They'll say TIC. And eventually, the adjustment stage is all about getting into the TIC stage. Begin to pick up more of the language. Establish more of a regular routine, both inside and outside of work. And this will lead to the acceptance stage, where eventually you'll become familiar with the cultural differences, or familiar with your understanding. You'll have started learning Mandarin perhaps a little bit more and become more comfortable with your language level. Or even if you haven't started learning more, you will feel more comfortable with the little you know and realize that you can get by with what you have. You, by this point, have established more of a firm friendship group. You'll always find people who share similar interests to you when doing something as wild and crazy as moving abroad. If you're the kind of person who's going to do this, then you're likely going to be surrounded by other people who are the kind of person you are. You'll feel more established at work. You'll feel more confident in teaching. And China will begin, importantly, to feel more like a second home to you. Once this has been completed and once you return home, there's something to remember to take in mind as well, which is reverse culture shock. Now, in China, I'd say my honeymoon period, I had a very long one. I was quite, um, quite fortunate. I had about three months of a honeymoon period. I had about three months of a frustration stage. Then I had a very long um, stage of adapting before eventually for my final year being entirely in my stage of acceptance. Some people very quickly move through these and move into acceptance within a matter of two or three months. Some people get stuck on the stage for a little bit longer and that's absolutely fine. But for me, the hardest part was actually the reverse culture shock, was coming back home afterwards, was seeing this really slow pace of life that made me feel almost like I was sort of being lazy just for existing in Britain. Things began to seem more uneventful and mundane. There wasn't an exciting adventure every day or something a little bit crazy or something a little bit TIC that would happen to me. The changes that had occurred while I was away seemed pretty stark and sudden as well. It's almost like sort of people had moved on and left me behind in certain aspects. And I felt a bit of difficulty re-establishing a social life and moving back into the previous social circles that I had. Again, this will pass. Um, for me, it, it took a few months to. But importantly, with both culture shock and reverse culture shock, the most important thing is not feeling guilty about having these feelings and certainly not feeling guilty about burdening other people with them. Every other expat in China will have been through what you've been through. And if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have got through my culture shock. And everyone, and it's important to remember to rely on these people, to speak with these people, because they will help you and they make a huge difference. When it comes to experiences and journeys in China and um, getting it from the horse's mouth, so to say, you can browse our teacher experiences on our website, they're easily located, as well as blogs and journals, which are updated regularly from Opportunity China teachers. Now, before we finish, I'd just like to take any final questions um, that anyone might have. Okay, great. Well, if anyone does have any final questions, please do feel free to drop an email in to info at opportunity-china.com or you can email Steph or myself, Steph at opportunity-china.com or Will at opportunity-china.com and we'd be more than happy to help you out. Tomorrow, we are going to be looking at working life as a teacher in China. It's going to start again at 6 p.m. 
Um, it says GMT, I do apologize. It is now British summertime, so that should be BST, um, but it is going to be starting at 6 p.m. tomorrow. Um, during the webinar, we are going to be looking at what a day in the life of a teacher is going to be like. We're going to be looking at the Chinese education system. We're going to be looking at some of the challenges that you are likely to come up against as a teacher in China. Um, and we're going to be looking at some of the really joyful experiences that you can expect to have as well. Well, please do make sure you join us for tomorrow. It's been a pleasure um, delivering this webinar today. And I hope to see you all again tomorrow evening. Thank you very much and goodbye.